Welcome to Saving Lives, the Zero Overdose podcast. Here, we're dedicated to raising awareness and advocating for the prevention of overdose. Join us as we dive into insightful discussions, share personal stories of resilience, and commit to breaking the stigma surrounding addiction. Our goal is to foster compassion, provide understanding about safety planning and its pivotal role in overdose prevention, promote access to resources, and ultimately inspire action. Welcome to Sibling Stories, Navigating Loss and Resilience After Overdose. I'm your host, Stacey Augusto, and today we have the honor of hearing from a remarkable individual who has chosen to share her journey with us. Joining us today is Cameron Romer, whose story is a testament to the profound impact of loss and unwavering strength of the human spirit. Cameron's experiences, particularly within the context of sibling relationships, offer invaluable insights into the complexities of grief and the power of resilience. So without further ado, let's welcome Cameron. Cameron, we're truly grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much. If we could just hear a little bit about your story or background and, and how you got connected to this work. Sure. I have worked in the criminal justice system and the prison system and the education system for my entire career. And while I was an administrator of a drug treatment court program, I also discovered at the time that my older brother was using drugs and his first arrest came on a Christmas day. And that was when we discovered that his addiction was full blown. Mm -hmm. From that point on, it was the next five or six years trying to manage his addiction, help guide the treatment options and participate as much as possible as the person that wanted to support him and had the information and knowledge of drug and alcohol Mm -hmm. through the addiction. And unfortunately, despite treatment attempts, relocation efforts, and everything else that anybody would attempt to do, my brother passed away from an overdose in 2019. Wow. I'm so sorry to hear that. So despite kind of all the help that you gave and maybe the resources that you had, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And I think that I knew I did have all of the resources and the knowledge. But what I had to realize was that he was on his own journey. And until he wanted to get better, nothing else was going to really work. But it was certainly easier on the family to have me have the experience and the knowledge to help navigate some of this. And he did not recover from it. Yeah. So, and I think your story, uh, a lot of people can relate to that. Can you talk a little bit about at what point in your process did you start to, to advocate for overdose prevention? Was it kind of at the same time all this was going on or? I had started working in the field and it was at the time there's been a huge shift in the criminal justice system to be less punitive and more restorative therapeutic. So I had been managing a drug treatment court and a mental health treatment court and was pretty immersed in the drug and alcohol world and well-connected, knew the latest treatment options that were available, knew enough people to be able to have the mental health component looked at, treated, and I had been an advocate. I would go home at night and continue to advocate, but also as a sibling and was really, there was a big difference between being a clinician and a supervisor of a program, knowing what to do, what should happen, and then actually experiencing and watching somebody so close to you deteriorate and feel super helpless. That was sort of the struggle that I had. And I continued to want to advocate for him and for siblings and family members that are not really included in the recovery process or the treatment process, which can be scary for a lot of people. And you bring up a good point. So I think when you're in the field and you work with addiction or mental health, you might have a little bit of like you're able to be a little more objective and removed. But when it's your own family, everybody's emotions are tied up in that. 
Sure. And it was, I was the only person with that knowledge. So I was always a conduit and the caretaker. And I took on that role and that came with its own complexities, navigating that and following my brother passing away after a lot of things had occurred in our lives as a family. I had been laying in my bed, remember, like trying to find something that would give me some sort of peace or resolution with the whole passing away. Did I do enough? All of the questions that I, I would ask myself. And when I went to research grieving a sibling, the most striking thing I came across is that there was more information available about grieving the loss of a pet than there was a sibling. Wow. Yeah. So I, I was going to ask. So I think, you know, I know that there's support for spouses, there's support for parents and not much maybe for siblings or visibility even into how siblings are affected. And so I would, I would love to hear more about your experience with that. Yeah. I mean, that was my experience. We were in it alone. There, there were four of us before my brother passed and my sister and I were very, very, very invested in the day-to-day process of his recovery. I was the only person that he signed his consents for. So it seemed that that became my role, was communicating information to people about how he's doing, where he is, what they're saying. There was never an invitation for family to come to the program. Family counseling never happened. And so everybody was left in the dark. And then after his passing, I did go to a group and I felt like I didn't belong. A lot, the the audience or the participants in that group were mainly moms that have lost a child to an overdose. And for whatever reason, despite knowing that a loss is a loss, I felt less than or that there wasn't a space for my grief because these mothers lost their children. Okay, so you were able to find a group, but felt that you didn't belong. So what is that, do you think that's different? What do you think, I mean, not to sort of parse out or compare grieving experiences, right? But what do you think that the the vantage point of the sibling is? How, How do you think that's different from a parent or maybe a spouse? Sure. I mean, I the sibling part, if you're lucky enough, which I consider myself extremely fortunate to have all of my siblings as a best friend. And there's things that you experience where if you can, as children, identify, yes, that situation really did have a negative impact on me or the bond that you have because there's no other thing that's holding you together, but the fact that your siblings, you were raised together and you share mutual parents. And it's sort of, it feels like you don't expect your sibling to pass away in life's trajectory. So the loss of a parent is not less than losing anyone else, but it's almost expected in the li- in your lifetime. I don't think in your 30s, you expect to lose your sibling who's a few years older. And it was shocking. And it was people felt sad for my dad. And you don't want to take, you almost don't want to take away from that loss of a child. That is like something that just seems to be universally anybody's heart can bleed. But I don't think there's enough attention to the siblings surrounding that. Right. Right. That, that makes sense to me that when you, when anyone sees a parent going through the loss of a child, that that's just something you don't, you don't touch, that that's just witnessing that, you know, and, and then, but you're right. I I don't think that I've heard as much about what that might mean for a sibling going through that. Have you found anything that's been particularly helpful after discovering that there were no resources? Did you find anything that you thought worked? What I thought was super helpful was I what was an invitation to participate in a group where people are struggling with a family member in active addiction or somebody who has lost a family member to active addiction and hearing feedback from some of the mothers in particular that there would be space for you. Grief is grief. A loss is a loss. That was inviting Mm -hmm. to be 
it wasn't enough to get me to go back, but there has been no other formalized group that I've been able to find about that. And I'm not sure that the the cause of death matters either. Yeah. I think losing a sibling is just, I expected that we grew old together. Right, right. So it's the sort of the shock of it, or just like you said, the, the you know, the unexpectedness of it. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. Do you, if we pivot a little bit to your work since then, what kinds of things or activities have you been involved in regarding overdose awareness, safety, prevention? I do complete drug and alcohol evaluations. I deal a lot with the family court system and try to offer comprehensive drug and alcohol treatment plans to the court for an individual that is suffering from addiction. There's local organizations that I will either speak at or attend their events. More recently, I know that a local organization has done a family component, but it's just me. So I don't go. It's a lot of children and grandparents. But again, it's another area where I think siblings are actually not included in people that are surviving the loss of a loved one. Are there any policy changes or community support changes that you would hope to see when addressing the overdose crisis? I I believe the education component is super important to the individual recovering as well as to what the addiction of one person, the ripple effects can do to family dynamic so that there is not less of a shock, but almost when someone's in an active addiction, these are typical behaviors that you would expect to see. If they enter into treatment, the laws surrounding confidentiality and drug and alcohol are extremely strict. They may or we may not be able to verify if your loved one is here. Just the anxiety every day that I would experience when I couldn't get a response from my brother. Didn't know where he was. We would almost completely panicked. And then one day it just comes true, unfortunately. And so, you know, policy that I could think of for bereavement when you lose a sibling, you get three days and then I was supposed to be better and back to work and functioning. To me, I don't think the shock wore off within the first few months. So something to consider how it really does and will the addiction and then it's there's unfortunately the loss of somebody. There's no guidelines. There's no, this is where you can turn to. You're just sort of left to figure it out. Yeah, I I agree with that. I've worked in the field for a long time. And I think what's the most shocking for people is that it's kind of a black box about all kinds of things, right? People think, you know, somebody goes to quote unquote rehab and they're going to come out and it's going to be done and we're good. Right. And I I think that, you know, a lot of people don't understand how treatment works or what to expect. Yes. And there's a lot of judgment. That's another thing that I really struggled with at the time I was a professional in the community. And at one point, my brother decided he wanted to be closer to me and move locally. And I panicked. I didn't want him to be in the same place that a lot of my clients would have been. He was crossing into my personal life and boundaries were definitely difficult to establish. I think that my personality and just my experience with all of that helped. And I was able to keep him at least a little bit of a distance from me. But there was there was a lot of shame behind it initially to say, yes, I have you know, three siblings, one of them is currently a drug addict, especially because he wasn't in his active addiction and didn't start really destructive behavior until his later 30s came around. That was hard to overcome. And I, without an individual therapist, I don't think that I would have 
been able to deal with that and the stigma and the judgment and the shame every day. Right. And it it sounds like you were playing a lot of different roles. You had a lot of different hats in the system of helping your brother. Am I a counselor today? Am I am I a sibling? Right. And I, I imagine there was probably a role you had to play with your parents. Sure. Would you do you feel comfortable kind of talking about that? Like what do you what was your experience being the sibling? And then what did your parents kind of maybe not expect, but what did you sort of, how did you interact with them? You know, my brother only had a relationship with my father. Our biological mom passed away 42 years ago. So he was really not involved. And there was a lot of resentment on my end that I had to deal with his child. And he seemed to be pretty removed from it. There was a lot of he should just get sober and he needs to do it without the understanding of like, it just, why would you say that? It doesn't make sense. Like he obviously needs help and he wasn't involved for the most part. I was the one that had to let him know when I had been informed that my brother passed away. And oh, wow. It definitely put a damper on the relationship between myself and my father that I've had to just work through on my own and decide that he was struggling with where his child was at. And we have different backgrounds and knowledge base. So if this is how he chooses to look at it, that's that's on him. Till this day, I would do anything to save my brother's life. Yes. And defend him. Okay. So that's that's... Maybe others can relate. So your experience was that your father was pretty removed. Yes. Okay. And you had the responsibility, whether or not, you know, you chose that or it was placed on you, you were the one really kind of keeping an eye on your brother. All the time. There was times where my father went and checked on him at least one time, I know, and ended up taking him to a hospital. But he was pretty turned off by his behavior and inability to show up as a father and just the behaviors that accompany somebody who is actively using. And he just couldn't see his son as being sick. So he it was too much for him. I think so. Okay. And that right, I mean that that is an understandable reaction, I think. Now what you do with that is you know up for debate sure in some families the experience as you know with your work is you know sort of the the parent the the maybe the sibling someone in your role might have to do a lot of like reassuring of the parents or maybe all that we talk about is the sibling with the addiction You know, sort of like, I think that's the experience other people have. Maybe you had as well at times, right? Where it no longer is about you in your relationship with your parents and your parents taking care of you. It's all about that person with the addiction. Yes. And I do caution people that it it did consume my life. So I never felt like I had, in hindsight, it felt like I was working 24 hours a day because I would work and... Then I'd go home after work and deal with whatever pressing issue with my brother was going on that day. And in all of that, the conversations, he was the main focus. Yes. How's he doing? Have you heard from him? What do you think? What do you think's wrong with him? Every question under the sun and nothing else mattered. How did you feel about that? At the time, I mean, it was nice to have people maybe to talk to. I think it was too much for me. And I think we spent a lot of time worrying about things that we really couldn't control. My sister and I and my little brother, we wanted to control it. Mm -hmm. But we really couldn't. Right. And of course, we wanted to help him. It sounds like he has had a lot of support. He did. And your other siblings. Kind of going forward, do you think in terms of 
you know, advocacy work or raising awareness about addiction and overdose risk. What do you think is the way to go about that? What What is, I don't want to say what's worked for you, but what do you feel like has come the most naturally? And And I mean, because a lot of the focus sometimes is on celebrating the lives lost. And I would love to just hear kind of how you think about at this point, what has worked? I think, unfortunately, drug and alcohol has become its own entity. And I say, unfortunately, because I don't necessarily agree with just treating the disorder in a box. And I think that there's significant value in treating the the whole person. And that would include the family because you want the parent, the, the family to be that support when the person transitions out of wherever they are or back into a recovery setting. And I don't think that we spend enough time worrying about the aftermath, when this happens, how devastating it can be. And there's nothing concrete available for anybody after that. You're on your own to find a grief group, counseling, and there's a lot, there's an entire population of people that I think are walking around hurting. Mm -hmm. I hear that. And it sounds like kind of what I'm hearing as the theme today, Cameron, is that there's not a lot of support for siblings going through, you know, having a, a brother, sister, or sibling with addiction. And then of course, afterward, if God forbid the person passes, it sounded like you didn't know where to go. I didn't. I mean, I was fortunate enough to have the, the support system in my life that I needed. You know, I've been a clinician for a long time, so I personally knew where to go. But I watched both of my other siblings suffer differently. And I've really watched the dynamic in our family just change. It's not the same and it is never going to be the same. And we didn't have a guide through that. I don't even know that we really talk about it, but it's pretty obvious that things are just different now. And that's hard. It's hard to accept what the path forward is going to be. Yes. I'm really appreciative of you talking to us today. There's so many people out there that have experienced this and probably feel the same way. And so it's just good to get you know, to verbalize it, to, to give voice to your experience. And I really appreciate that. Is in my sort of last question here, what, what do you think for the listeners? What, what ways do you think the voices of siblings can maybe provide a unique contribution to overdose prevention and awareness? What do you think siblings kind of can bring to that? I think siblings can bring a level of support in a recovery process parents can't always do, especially depending on generations, their understanding, certainly the younger the generation these days, the more aware of the drug epidemic they seem to be. So, and and the amount of treatment and what is available and there's no guarantee with the first time in rehab, what it takes post rehab. I think a lot, there's more, that information is out there. What I would like to see is siblings really at least helping shape the way treatment is delivered to the patient because the family unit is is affected. And the focus typically becomes on the person with the addiction. And what about the people that are still in this family unit that just fade away Mm -hmm. or have jobs to take care of their parent or to take care of the sibling, but don't get acknowledged as this was the greatest loss I could have ever suffered in my life. Right. Yes. And so that's pretty profound, actually, what you said is that siblings can offer a unique contribution to the person with the addiction, right? And that maybe parents can't. And that's that's really interesting. And that, I think, you know, what it sounds like you're saying is that 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 the sibling can really have an impact in a way maybe a parent can't or is just sort of bound by that relationship. Sure. 
And I think that unless a parent's willing to be brutally honest, they may not know how they impacted the child, but the children typically do and talk about it. So even a session to say, hey, that experience with so-and-so when we were kids really did happen or it really was awful. I can't imagine how that's affected you. Have you talked about that in your treatment? Right. But there's a lot of barriers for good and for bad in connecting with a drug and alcohol treatment facility if you're not on a person's contact list. Right, right. You know, the other sort of theme that we've we've talked about is just the the support for siblings as they're going through this and, you know, watching their sibling that that has a, an addiction. Sure. Um, and I think there's a grief of the parent. So yeah. you not only are losing your sibling to the addiction and if it, you know, unfortunately ends in the, the way that my story ended with my brother, you know, the the role of my parent is different. Mm-hmm. He's not. So you're losing two. Right. And in, it sounds like you found, you know, you had to sort of carve out your own supports. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, Cameron, once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for all of your work and your willingness to talk so openly about something so personal. I, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Saving Lives, the Zero Overdose podcast. We're grateful for your support and commitment to our mission of raising awareness and advocating for overdose prevention. For more information, resources, and ways to get involved, visit our website at zerooverdose.org.